Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Fagam Radian here up on Capitol Hill for the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies panel discussion on air superiority. We had the Air Force's Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance Chief, uh, Lieutenant General Jameson, as well as the Operations uh, Chief, Lieutenant General Mark uh, Noland, who were both uh, here. And we've got with us uh, General Dave Deptula, who is a uh, retired United States Air Force Lieutenant General, former ISR Chief of the Air Force, one of the critical uh, air power thinkers uh, in the nation and the dean of the Mitchell Institute. Um, Dave, happy new year. Uh, and I wanted to start off, you know, what do you think were the key takeaways uh, from this uh, discussion today? There were so many fascinating points that were uh, raised by both uh, Dash Jameson and Hit Me Noland. Talk to us a little bit about what you thought were the key takeaways. Well, I think uh, first, uh, happy new year to you too, uh, Vago, I, and wish you all the best in 2018. I think probably the first one to hit is that we have a magnificent set of men and women uh, who are operating our airspace and cyber systems, doing their best to meet the challenges of the current day. Uh, and they can do that today. Uh, the concern is the proliferation and the growing set of capabilities uh, in terms of quality and quantity of potential threats in the future. So are we going to be able to handle uh, that increase in threat capability in the future? And are we going to be able to do it in more than one place at a time? Uh, and, and I think that, you know, one of the things that is constraining the current force is the lack of investment in the desired quantity of systems that will allow us to maintain uh, what we've enjoyed in terms of historic air supremacy wherever we go to fight. Um, you uh, played a, uh, a a very provocative video talking about air defense threats. It's one of the best films, actually, to give even a layperson an understanding of the kind of capabilities that are being developed, both on the air system side by China uh, and Russia, Thank but in you. particular, <laughs> in particular uh, on the air defense side. You know, when you see the S-500 overlaid on an American context, if you put that uh, rig at the Washington Monument, you're projecting an air power dome that goes as far north as Buffalo and as far south as Charlottesville. Talk to us a little bit Charlotte. about Charlotte, excuse me, not yeah. Charlottesville, Charlotte. Um, talk to us a little bit uh, about what you heard uh, both General Noland and General Jamison say about the evolution of the threat. But also, you know, one of the calls that General Nolan made was, we need bigger air ranges now. You know, we've gotten into this very constrained uh, growth in air traffic is tremendous. Uh, you know, encroachment has been right. tremendous. Talk to us about both of those themes and what you think the Air Force has got to be thinking and doing to set itself up for future success. Well, first, you, you key on um, one of the significant factors that's out there. People tend to think symmetrically. So when you think about... Uh, an air superiority threat, they tend to think about another airplane. That's not the case. Um, we can handle potential adversary aircraft today, but those advanced surface-to-air missile systems that you saw, the example that you raised, uh, can be a real problem. So it was encouraging to hear both General Jamison and General Nolan talk about the fact um, that we need to think in a much more holistic fashion uh, to capitalize on, on, on innovative information age technologies to defeat those threats, which gets us into the whole discussion space, uh, shorthand notion of combat cloud, where we have aircraft, sensors in space, on the ground, at sea, in the air, uh, that act as information nodes, sharing information, not just information, but also the offboard capability to engage threats um, off board the aircraft that we have come to believe historically is the way that we fight. So it's a whole different paradigm of war fighting. Uh, and the services, all of the services to a degree, are beginning to embrace that concept of operations. Um, G General Nolan talked about the changes in football, for example, that in 1973 the game was very, very different. Uh, it wasn't as much of a passing game. You know, he noted that the Miami Dolphins, you know, it was, you know, in a game would do 15 passes. Now, you know, everybody's passing all the time. They're using the fullness of the field as right. opposed to narrow corridors. And the analogy he made is the importance to think sort of more broadly. Uh, don't think one-on-one. -on -one. Don't think right. only new-new. You have, uh, for as long 
long as I've known you, which is quite some time, uh, you were talking about the blurring of lines, that it's not an F or an A 20, more than 20 years right. ago. You were looking at these each as nodes on a, in a battle space. Uh, and we're talking also across the joint force, right? How you Absolutely. can use stuff from, from each of the military services. So the question that I have for you is, you know, as you look at this uh, future combat air environment, how far ahead is our talk than the reality of where we are in our thinking and in the way, you know, what are some of the changes that have to happen? Because folks have a tendency of talking about it, but the capability is still elusive. If you look at each one of the military services, General Goldfein, I think, was a little bit ahead of everybody about using uh, a, co a great command and control system, but the criticism is each of the services are stovepiping their command and control ser uh, systems, and they're not going to be as interoperable as they need. Right. Well, th what, are, what are some of the things that the whole force has got to be doing to get to this seamless future that you and, well, and, uh, and the folks up on the podium today were talking about? It's an excellent question, uh, and there is a tension um, in the way that we're organized today. Because the services, the role of the services, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, um, is to organize, train, and equip components who then the component commands put together to actually go fight. So that's what's driving a bit of this stovepipe development and things like command and control. Um, so if we're actually going to actualize the notion of a combat cloud, where you're using ground, sea, air, space, subsea elements in a holistic, integrated, uh, multi-domain fashion, we have to break down the ways that we used to, f that, that, that historically we've employed force. And that's a hard thing. As you mentioned, I, I talked about shedding this anachronistic nomenclature of fighters and bombers and cargo aircraft for over 20 years. I'm still talking about it. I know you're sick of hearing it. I love hearing but, but it every the, time you say it. But the young people out there, you, you, you know, have, have, have only experienced what they've been told. The Department of Defense and the military are perhaps the most conservative institutions in the world. Now, you can make a point whether that's a good thing or a not so good thing. But it takes longer, unfortunately, than some of us think that we have to be able to adopt to a much, much more integrated approach when it comes to developing weapon systems, command and control, and concepts of operation. I'll give you a good case in point. The Army today, when they talk about multi-domain battle, they're not even thinking about the Air Force being able, or the air component being able to provide air superiority. They're out looking at ways to accumulate resources to do it all on their own. You know, it's a step away from Goldwater Nichols, not towards a truly integrated uh, joint approach. Well, some would say that's uh, going away from uh, actually even even Key West. Um, let me ask you about North Korea. Um, it, you know, the both the general officers uh, punted on the question when it was um, how significant an air defense picture is that. Uh, you stepped in at the end and said significantly w uh, more contested than we've faced over the past few decades. You know that airspace. You've tracked uh, these events in as much as you can publicly discuss it. How significant an air defense challenge is over North Korea right now in the event of crisis and in the event that airmen have to operate over that airspace in support of ground operations? Well, no one would, 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 would speak to particular tactics or operational techniques, but in general, um, it poses a significant challenge. Um, are we equipped to meet that challenge? Uh, today, I'd say yes. But e, one of the problems with a series of operations, particularly the air components have been involved in over the last 20 years, is we make the very difficult look very easy when in fact it's not. Uh, and um, so um, it will be challenging. Uh, however, it'll be something that we can accomplish. Let me ask you one last question. General Nolan, you know, you made the case and you've been making a very full-throated case and you did at the beginning of this conversation about why the Air Force has to be buying more F-35As at a much higher pace than 46, right. whether it was 140-something or 112, right. which was a number at one point. Um, do you think that the success of the airplane is actually what's going to constrain the number that are ultimately bought? Because when you listen to each one of these exercises, there are much higher uh, exchange rates. There are a lot of classified information about what it can right. do uh, You know that, that folks are not discussing publicly. Do you think that that's going to be a limiting factor, that the program becomes a little bit of a victim of its own success? Um, not if people think through 
the strategic rationale for why we need force structure to be able to effectively operate, win and succeed in more than one regional con uh, contingency at a time. I mean, I'll use F-22 as an example. Um, you know, Secretary Gates made a very, very unfortunate and short-sighted decision in terminating the F-22 at less than 50% its military requirement because of his belief that, well, we're not using it in Iraq, so what do we need it for? And China is so far out there as a threat, we don't have to worry about it. So now we have less than 120 combat-capable F-22s. And if you look about around the world, we couldn't put more than about 30 of them airborne at any one time. Now, 30? Entire world? The threats that are out there? You look at the mischief Russians and what they've done in uh, uh, Crimea, Ukraine, Syria. You don't think that if an operation occurs on the Korean Peninsula that perhaps Putin will take advantage of that uh, in Europe or China in the South China Sea. Um, so uh, numbers uh, are, are very important uh, in addition to capability. Lieutenant General Dave Deptula, retired United States Air Force, uh, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. Sir, thanks very much. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.